fantastic. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, this is a talk that kind of um, started about a year ago when the Ingenuity helicopter was um, about to take its first uh, flight on Mars. Um, and our local society, we were chatting away on WhatsApp and um, uh, somebody mentioned that the uh, piece of the um, Wright Brothers um, canvas was actually on the Ingenuity helicopter. And I went, yeah, that's right. And then I was saying, NASA does this a lot. And I listed a load of things and we said, oh, that would make a good talk. So we decided to go ahead with it. We, it they helped me give it a working title, NASA Does Nostalgia. Um, and this is what it is. So it's about all of the unusual things that NASA have sent into space. Some of them uh, are more well known than others. Some of them are little clues that they've hidden. Some of them are little um, messages that they're sending to extraterrestrial um, beings. Now, NASA is no, um, um, uh, they're not new to tradition. So um, they've done lots of things over the years. You probably know that they have uh, peanuts when um, they pass around peanuts during critical parts of uh, their missions. Um, and this goes back to the uh, mid 60s when the uh, Ranger mission uh, had six failures, uh, one to six. And on the seventh one, um, one of the engineers passed around peanuts to try and relieve the situation and make things a little bit calmer. Um, and it worked. And uh, ever since then, they've been passing them around for, um, for launches up until the Voyager. It was uh, for launches. And now they do it at all critical maneuvers, uh, whether it's um, uh, orbital insertions or landings and things like that. Um, they do another one called Beans Are Go. So ever since the first launch of STS-1 of the, uh, the, the space shuttle, um, they used to um, uh, cook up uh, beans to um, beans and sausages and that to, to, to have uh, as part of their meal as a, as, as a sort of a thank you. And then it becomes such a big tradition that the, uh, uh, the NASA director that introduced it passed it over to the catering staff. So that then become a tradition. Then, of course, there's the traditional meal that all the astronauts have before they leave, including all of the Apollos of the, uh, the steak, the eggs and the cake. And it doesn't matter what time they take off. It's all to do with the fact that it's a, uh, a high protein diet. So it helps them while they're uh, uh, up in space. And then this one comes back from the aviator days. Obviously, NASA's uh, uh, followed a lot of the tradition of um, aviators. Uh, and this is called Cutting the Ties, where uh, during a successful mission, one of the NASA directors will cut the tie just below the, uh, uh, the neck of one of the rookies there uh, shortly after takeoff. So NASA's not new to tradition. Uh, and the sorts of objects that I'm going to be talking about today are things like extraterrestrial um, messages that they're sending out to tell people about human existence, uh, mementos or exhibition pieces that eventually come back to Earth uh, and end up in a museum. Contraband. Now, I don't mean things like drugs or anything like that. No, what I mean is things that were taken onto a spacecraft that weren't officially part of the flight manifest. Uh, and then, of course, there's PR stunts. Uh, things that um, try and encourage uh, people into the space industry. So we've got all of that going on. Um, so it's really an excuse for me to talk about a wide area of uh, lots of different missions, um, and I've broken them down into segments. So the first half, part I'm going to talk about is NASA's golden age, which is the, uh, the Mercury, Gemini and Apollo era, which we were talking about uh, not so long ago. So the Mercury project was the first human spaceflight program for the United States, and it ran from 1958 to 1963. Um, seven astronauts were chosen and they were called the Mercury 7. Now, only six of those astronauts flew because uh, Dick Slayton has grounded due to an uh, irregular heart rhythm, but he did eventually fly in the um, later Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975 when he was medically cleared. Um, so some of the earlier things that were done, so um, um, monetary souvenirs of, of accompanied astronauts on uh, lots and lots of uh, early spaceflight missions, and the Mercury astronauts took small banknotes um, that were signed um, uh, as mementos by the astronauts, but they were also signed by the FIA or, or the FAI, which were the um, uh, the flight regulation uh, board at the time that was certifying the, whether it's actually a flight or not. And all of this was due to the Yuri Gagarin flight, where there was lots of 
irregularities that were um, uh, coming to light during that time because of course he he ejected before he landed um, so he, he actually landed not inside his spacecraft was against FIA regulations at that time so in order for uh, NASA to get over that they signed these dollar bills um, and they also got them countersigned by people by the FAI they went up in the space shuttle uh, in the spacecraft and when they came back down again they could then prove that it was the same spacecraft that's uh, gone up and come back down again so uh, and they're also kept as mementos um, so one of those early missions was the Liberty Bell 7, which was the uh, Gus Grissom um, flight, successful um, suborbital flight. But when it came back down, the, the hatch inexplicably blew open and water started pouring in. Um, and eventually it got so heavy, the helicopter couldn't lift it and uh, it dragged it down to the, um, the bottom of the uh, bottom of the ocean. Um, Gus Grissom's suit himself started filling up and he was waving to the helicopter and everyone thought he was all right because he was waving. But in fact, he was starting to get heavier and heavier. Eventually, he was um, was rescued and the, um, the actual craft itself uh, stayed underwater uh, and was recovered on the 20th of July 1999. But it wasn't actually reported in the news till the 21st of July because that was the 30th anniversary of the Apollo mission. So that obviously took precedence on the news. So um, uh, what was recovered from those were these um, dimes that you can see, the 1944 Wing Liberty Head dimes. And there were 52 of them that Gus Grissom had taken up with him. And of course, they stayed at the bottom of the ocean until um, it was recovered um, 30 odd years later. Uh, Friendship 7. Now, this was the uh, the John Glenn mission uh, and became the first American to orbit the Earth um, in his Friendship 7 capsule. Uh, and along with him on that mission, there were 32 dollar bills and um, uh, 32 one and two dollar bills that were all secreted on board by the support crew who'd signed the bills with good luck wishes to Glenn. And they taped them around the internal wiring of the spacecraft. And these bills were then famously signed by John Glenn. Uh, and used as formalized certificates to say that he'd um, he'd made his flight. So moving on to the Gemini missions now, and this was the uh, the, the second human spaceflight program for the Americans, uh, and it was the uh, the two man um, missions that were then practicing things like docking and EVAs ready to uh, to do the Apollo mission to land on the moon. Um, the first of those was Gemini 3, uh, and it was the first to carry two astronauts who were uh, John Young and Gus Grissom. Now, Gus Grissom here took his 1964 Roosevelt silver dime with him during this mission, uh, and the dime was carried especially for Gunter Vent, who was NASA's well-respected um, pad leader at the time during the 1960s. Um, now, after the mission, he scratched the initials GT3, which you can probably see on there, onto the surface of the coin adjacent to um, FDR's chin, uh, and then presented it to Venn afterwards. Now, the Gemini meal packages included freeze-dried entree, vegetable drink, uh, dessert, and they were all protected in a four-ply laminated film coated bag um, and Young wasn't really impressed with this um, meal option so what he did is he slipped a corned beef sandwich into his pocket just before launch and as a result um, it, it did spark a little bit of conversation um, but only about sort of a couple of minutes during their six hour uh, mission and um, a 50 year old corned beef sandwich it's preserved in resin as you can see on the image there and it sits on the uh, the Virgil Gus Grissom Memorial Museum uh, in Indiana so yes so they were smuggling food on board as well um, now this one in December uh, 1965 now December just make a note of that two astronauts um, aboard the uh, Gemini 6 mission here who are Wally Shirar and Thomas Stafford um, they rendezvoused the previous day with Gemini 7 uh, and their fellow astronauts Frank Gorman and Jim Lovell that was the first crew space rendezvous in human history but just before re-entry Gemini 6 reported something very odd and unusual. Now, just in case you can't make out the transcript, I've put the, uh, the, the, the words up there as well. 
didn't come out very well did you no it didn't, no, it didn't come out very well oh well <laughs> um so basically they they played a a joke on them and they told them that they could see something coming over the horizon and then just when they said oh it's going to send us a message they started playing the um uh, the harmonica there and played the jingle bells there as well um and, and then they played a joke on them just to say Frank that could, could see Santa coming over the uh, the horizon. Um, and then in 1967, Wally Sherrard donated his little harmonica to the Smithsonian Museum. And according to the Smithsonian Magazine, together these um, made the first musical instruments that were ever played in space with jingle bells being the first ever performance. Um, now, during the uh, the early times, they had some medals that started with the uh, the Gemini missions back in March 1965, and they went all the way up to the uh, Apollo, ill-fated Apollo 1 mission, uh, and they were flight line medallions that were etched with the uh, the date of the actual um, uh, mission, uh, and also with the insignia on the front as well. Now, the thing is with the flight line medallions, Nobody knew how many there were that were flown. They didn't have any um, serial numbers. So they weren't really um, sought after by collectors, but they certainly existed. Um, but it was very difficult to prove if it actually went into space or not. Um, now, moving on to the Apollo missions. Um, the Apollo missions, very iconic missions, and also took some iconic things with them to the moon. Um, the first mainly was the Apollo 11. Um, first, you can see up there, there was a silicon disc that they took um, on that was engraved by uh, messages from uh, leaders from all around the world, including the Queen, um, Indira Gandhi, Pope John Paul VI, uh, and uh, a list of NASA leaders as well that, were, uh, that had signed it. Um, there were two medals that were, were uh, awarded to Russian cosmonauts Yuri Gagarin and Vladimir Komarov, Komarov who uh, unfortunately perished. And their widows had given the medals to Frank Borman, who then passed them on to the Apollo 11 crew, who then put them on the, uh, the surface of the moon. There was an Apollo 1 mission patch to, uh, to, to commemorate the, uh, uh, the fire of the, the, the Apollo 1 astronaut, uh, where we lost the Apollo 1 astronauts. Um, and then there was a, an olive branch, which is a, a symbol of peace. And then, of course, as, as, as we've mentioned before, this has been to uh, the moon and, and many parts of the solar system. Parts of the, um, uh, the plane from the uh, Wright Brothers plane um, stayed on Tranquility Base, but it, it landed on the moon, but then went back and was now put on the Smithsonian Museum inside this frame. So lots went on the uh, uh, Apollo 11 mission. Um, so Apollo 12, Apollo 12, um, Al Bean had taken a silver pin that was um, uh, in honor of uh, Clifton Williams, who he'd actually replaced um, as part of the mission. Now, Williams served as a backup pilot for the Gemini 10 mission in um, July of 66. But following this mission, he was selected to be lunar module pilot for an Apollo mission to the moon that was going to be commanded by um, Pete Conrad. But he was killed in a plane crash in October 1967. And Al Bean became the uh, lunar module pilot in his place. Um, Apollo 13 had some um, micro uh, microchip Bibles, actual Bibles that you could read through a, um, a microscope. Um, and they were taken around the moon, obviously, and they never landed on the moon, but they did end up landing on the moon with Apollo 14. So there's some Bibles that have been to the moon and come back again. They're only about an inch and a half by an inch and a half, and there's probably only about 100 that were uh, uh, survived from the um, initial lot that uh, went up there on Apollo 13. And then, of course, Apollo 14, the very famous uh, golf shot where um, he'd used a... Um, a golf club that was in fact um uh it was a converted uh 
iron and a, an aluminium rock sampler that uh, that he'd used a sample scooper uh, along with the golf ball that had, had the date of his um uh, when he hit it um now a lot for apollo 15 apollo 15 had a bible that was um taken up there by uh, david scott um he'd taken it from his local church and he's left it on the moon so an actual bible is up there as well on the lunar rover um also there's the uh, the fallen astronaut which is a, a, a three and a half um three and a half inch sized aluminium figure uh, along with names of um 14 known astronauts who had passed away during the exploration of space so they were left up there as well um and then of course probably the most famous is the um postal uh, covers that they'd smuggled on board and then ended up taking back down and they got reprimanded over it because they tried to make some money from it so they'd got them signed before they went up there taken them to the moon and they were going to make some money for it when they came back um and a guy called um herman seager uh, was going to sell them for them and they became known as the seager covers because of that so yes very famous postal scandal that had happened um moving on to apollo 16 now now apollo 16 saw uh, charlie duke take his first steps on the moon and he was only 36 at the time so he's the youngest human ever to have walked on the moon but while he was on the moon he left a family portrait of him his two sons and his wife that remains on the moon to this day and inscribed on the back is that this is the family of astronaut charlie duke on planet earth who landed on the moon on april the 20th 1972 and it's say it's still there today and Apollo 17 crew, they carried um, some small flags from 135 countries and uh, 50 US states. And um, some of the, uh, the the rock samples that they got back were uh, uh, segmented up and given to those countries um, with the flags that went to the moon. And they were called the Goodwill, uh, the Good Moon Rocks, Goodwill Moon Rocks. Uh, and this one is the one that's actually on display at the uh, Natural History Museum in London. So if you want to go down and have a look at that, you'll be able to see that. Um, now, the Robbins medallions were sort of uh, a little bit more on from the flight line medallions. But these ones actually had um, serial numbers on them. So they were sought after for collectors. There were some gold and silver ones. So the gold ones were for the astronauts and silver ones were for the, uh, um, the other people that could buy them. Um, and they were inscribed with the uh, the logo on the front and all of the date and everything on the back and the more uh, apollo ones had the launch date the date that it landed and the date that it were returned so these were uh, highly sought after by collectibles but some of the problems with them because they were struck so close to um, launch time if there were any changes it was very difficult to get them restruck and I'll give you some examples of those, which is the Apollo 13, um, because um, uh, Mattingly had um, uh, been subjected to potentially the measles and was uh, and was replaced um, by uh, uh, Jack Swagger and eventually, or John Swagger even, and eventually they had to get the medallions out there, bring them back, and they restruck them with the new names of the um, uh uh, astronauts there but of course they didn't have a landing date either so they changed the landing date to the aquarius odyssey which was the um uh, the lunar um the lunar module that was there that they were using so yeah it, because it was so close um they couldn't actually change anything and this is the same with the apollo 11 the apollo 11 iconic badge used to have the um the branch in the beak but they changed the design because it made the um eagle look menacing and they didn't it, it didn't go with the we come in peace that they were talking about um so the medallion still had the uh, branch in the beak but it was changed to the claws on the actual emblem that uh, that was used and then of course the uh, the actual apollo 11 one that was uh, the gold one that was the Armstrong took to the moon is now encapsulated and kept because uh, that's a part of our history, very, very much part of space history. So that will be looked after um, in a sealed container. So that's the Apollo missions. And then um, during the Skylab missions, a little bit later on, instead of using money, they changed it to stylized newspapers because uh, NASA astronauts were that then prohibited to carry 
uh, any kind of currency or um, uh, as personal memento or souvenirs. So yeah, they changed them to certificates. And a little bit later, they got they can get rid of the certificates because you've got um, TV, telemetries, and, and, and all sorts of uh, now uh, ways of tracking the flights to prove that they're true. So yeah, so in the early days, it was a case of um, yeah making it official. Um, deep space exploration now, so a couple of missions that are uh, a part of it here as you've got to the Pioneer, the Voyager and the New Horizons. Um, so the Pioneer itself was a mission that was a spacecraft that travelled uh, outside the asteroid belt for the first time uh, and the Pioneer 10 mission studied the um, uh, the belts of Jupiter and then launched just a year later was its uh, sister mission which was Pioneer 11 which was the uh, the second spacecraft that went outside and got a gravity cyst from Jupiter and onto Saturn um, and it studied Jupiter and Saturn while it was out there but the most um, iconic thing of the uh, the Pioneer mission was the greetings plaque that it had they were both fitted with these identical gold plaques that was intended to serve as um, messages to extraterrestrial life. Um, and the idea behind it that was um, designed mainly by Carl Sagan and a guy called Frank Drake, who was the founder of uh, SETI. Um, so what you've got on here is you've got 14 pulsars um, that are relative to the, um, uh, the sun, so 14 pulsars. You've got our sun here and where we are within that. Uh, you've got a couple of human beings here in relation to size relation to the um, mission itself. And then up here, you've got um, the uh, the transition of neutral hydrogen, which you'll come on to when I cover the, um, the Voyager disk in a moment. So, yes, Voyager. So the two Voyager probes were originally conceived as part of the Mariner program, uh, and they were originally going to be called Mariner 11 and Mariner 12, but then they were moved into a separate program uh, as part of the uh, the Voyager program um, because they wanted to take um, uh, take advantage of the planetary alignment so that you could use planetary um, slingshots from planet to planet to work your way through to the outer solar system. But the most iconic thing that the uh, the Voyager mission had on them was they both carried these 12 inch discs that were on there. So you had a cover and then you had the record inside. So they had some photographs on there. They had greetings in 55 different languages from Earth, 12 minute montages of sounds from Earth. And um, they had some music on there as well uh, of um, different eras of what was on there. So. Um, the golden record cover itself now it was made of um, uranium 238, which they could actually measure the decay of. Um, so when a um, if an extraterrestrial being got it, they could use the, um, the measure the decay and work out exactly when it was put on there. So that's the reason why they chose that. Um, now on the disc itself, you can see that it's it's etched with. Um, a, a coding really um, again you've got the um, the 14 um, pulsars that were uh, the known from from the sun um, with the binary code of what they were you've then got your um, the hydrogen atom now what you've got here is um, the diagram illustrates the lowest two states of the hydrogen atom and um, the vertical lines with the dots indicate spin uh, moments of the proton and the electron and every 100 million years or so the electron of a hydrogen flips and causes a slight change in frequency now this frequency is measured at 21 centimeters and it's called the 21 centimeter hydrogen line so then when it flips you've got your 21 centimeters that 21 centimeters converts to 14 1420 megahertz which is 7.042 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds or 0 0.7 nanoseconds. So this is our magic number. So this 21 centimeters converts to this 7.04 times 10 to the minus 10. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. So if we move on to the next one, you can see the side view. And if you can convert this binary number here 
which you can see one zero 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 one so it's easy enough to understand there if you convert that it becomes that if you times that by our magic number in the corner you get 3229 seconds which is 53.82 minutes which is the total runtime of the record if you then have a look at this diagram up here you can see the top view again you can see the binary around the outside with all the ones and the zeros you convert that into binary and it gives you that times our magic number in the corner and that gives you 3.59 seconds which is the time for one revolution of the record so what we're doing is we're slowly um, uh, calibrating so that you can get to see the record and if you calibrate it right you'll get to hear 55 um, different languages saying hello um, 12 minute montage of music which includes people like Bach, Mozart, Chuck Berry um, and the English for hello was done by uh, Carl Sagan's son. So on the B side then the next symbol is a wave that's broken up again you've got a binary so if you then convert that binary into a number times it by our magic number in the corner and that gives you 0.08 milliseconds which is the time between the peaks of the waves if you then take the next section down here and again you've got some more binary down here and that will give you a number of 512 in binary which is the number of scan lines that make up the complete image um, for each one uh, and that's the total number of scan lines that are on the disk and then if you calibrate that bit right your first image should be a circle and then if you play the disc and you get a circle then you know you've calibrated it right and what you'll get to see then is loads of different images of the earth that you've seen so that's like um, whales and um, different buildings and things like that so when we grew up we were told that number 42 is the answer to the life the universe and everything Whereas, in fact, it's the number 21. Um, moving on to New Horizons now. So New Horizons was a mission that went out to Pluto in 2006. At the time, it was the ninth planet. But that summer, it got um, uh, downgraded by the, uh, uh, the International Astronomical Union to just a dwarf planet. But it was already en route. And it contained nine secrets so it's the ninth planet it had nine secrets on board so the first one in the top left hand corner it carried some of clive tombow's ashes who discovered it in 1930 and the next image it carried um two cd roms one that contained um photos um from the mission team and the other one contained photos and um, names of space enthusiasts um, the next one along here was a part of Spaceship One, which was um, an unsuccessful private initiative to, um, to, to try and commercialise space. Um, but then they'd taken some of that um, and, and took it along to New Horizons to Pluto with them. Um, you've then got um, a stamp proclaiming Pluto not yet explored because the US Postal Service had um sent out a set of stamps saying that all of the planets have been explored this one and that one and when they got to pluto because it hadn't been explored that's just what they had to put on it when they launched the set um so the the ironic thing is that they took a, a stamp of pluto not yet explored to go and explore pluto so it's quite funny i think that's quite a good story um there was two u.s quarters on there uh, so one from maryland and one from florida which is where the um uh, uh the spacecraft was built and launched respectively and there was two different types of flags on there as well so um two different types of american flags so that's your your nine secrets that were hidden on board the uh, new horizons um now i wasn't going to talk about scientific instruments here but there is one scientific instrument here here it's a dust collector um but it's called venetia bernie 
and the Venetia Burney dust collector was named after Venetia Burney, who was the um, child that gave allegedly Pluto its name. So even though it's a scientific instrument, it's still got some bearing over being sort of like an artifact or, or something humble and has gone into space. Um, moving on to the gas giants now. So we've got the Cassini mission that went out to Saturn. Um, that had a disc on it of 616,000 signatures um, that was then stowed on board behind this little um, uh, emblem I'm here and covered to help it protect it when it went up. So they sent the, the, um, uh, the disc out to lots of different places and asked people if they wanted to put their signatures on there. And then all of the flags are in order in the number of signatures that have come back. Um, it also bears the signature of certain celebrities like Patrick Stewart, Chuck Norris, uh, and it's also got the signatures on it of um, Dominic Cassini and Christian Huygens, from whom the Saturn V missions um, were named after. So you had the Cassini mission and the Huygens probe that landed on Titan, and they were copied from 17th century documents. Um, the Juno mission. So the Juno mission went to Jupiter uh, and it's still going. It was due to be um, uh, decommissioned last year, but they've continued its uh, voyage right up until 2025, 2026, as it goes out, work its way out to the moons. Now that's got a couple of little um, uh, unusual bits on it. So it's got three Lego figures on it. That's got it's Galileo, uh, the Roman god Jupiter and his wife uh, Juno. Now, Galileo, because he discovered the Galileo moons and, uh, and made um, uh, Jupiter famous and looked at it through the telescope. You've got uh, the Roman god Jupiter himself, and then you've got Juno. And she's got a magnifying glass because legend has it that she used to look through the clouds to see what he was up to because he was a bit of a player. And it's quite ironic that um, Juno now, uh, the spacecraft is looking through the clouds of Jupiter to see what that's all about. So uh, I think that's quite a nice story and uh, uh, something that NASA have uh, made a big thing out of. Uh, and they also carried a little plaque that was um, donated to them by um, the Italian Space Agency. Uh, and it's got a text on it that was written by Galileo and the translations of it down here um, of, of, of what it says. So, yes, that's uh, quite fitting that uh, those are on the the Juno mission and Lego features quite a lot because they want to try and encourage people to um, uh, get into space and the good way of um, getting that message out to children is to associate space missions with um, with Lego. Um, now Mars rovers, Mars rovers have taken a lot of stuff to um, uh, Mars as well as doing a lot of science. Um, probably um, uh, the most famous ones, really Spirit and Opportunity, who really were the first geologists of, of Mars back in uh, 2004. Now, they carried a couple of disks with them as well. Um, and the um, they had 10,000 uh, entries that were written on the disk. But there's also a coding that's written around the outside of each one that if you go to these websites here, Mars DVD codes, and then also for the solutions. So I'm not going to do the solutions for you now. There's a little puzzle on there that you can try and unravel if you wanted to. <clears throat> now, Spirit itself, when it landed, it landed at a site called the Columbia Memorial Site, and that was in honour of the seven astronauts who were killed in the uh, Columbia disaster. And while it was there, it was... It, it found a set of hills that had seven peaks uh, and they were called the Columbia Hills and named after each of the seven astronauts who um, who fatally um, were killed during that um, during that event. Opportunity on a similar note, uh, when that landed, its site was called the Challenger Memorial Site, which was uh, obviously in honour of the um, astronauts who died on the, the Challenger mission. Um, the Challenger disaster back in 1986. Um, now, Spirit and Opportunity also had another hidden message on them. Um, the story goes of the company called Honeybee Robotics, who are based in uh, New York. 
they make lots of uh, robotic stuff for, for, for generalized use for um, advertisement boards in New York, but sometimes they get contracts to make stuff for NASA. Uh, on another particular occasion, they were making a, a drill sampler for the Spirit and Opportunity uh, missions. Um, this was back in uh, 2001 when this happened. Uh, and the story goes that the uh, CEO and co founder, Stephen Gorovan, was cycling through. New York at the time on his way to work when this happened um, because it affected them uh, well it affected everyone from around the world but because they were based in New York um, they were heavily affected by it so they used their New York connections to um, speak to the emergency services speak to the mayor um, and get parts of the uh, the metal left over from the the, 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 the Twin Towers disaster uh, the World Trade Center and they made a drill cover that were um, on the two Spirit and Opportunity rovers that are on Mars. So this bit with the uh, the flag on it is actually part of the World Trade Center. So it's a good homage of um, them being on Mars at the moment. So an everlasting memorial um, for the people of uh, the World Trade Center. Um, Curiosity, uh, Curiosity landed the biggest thing at the time that we'd landed. It was just under a ton. We've landed Perseverance since then, which is over a ton. Um, but that was back in 2012, so quite a feat. And they even had to use the crane method to, to get it down to the surface because it was so big because it couldn't stop on jets and parachutes on its own. Um, but it carried a little penny with it as well. So it was the, uh, the Lincoln penny that was actually part of the um, uh, the set up system so that they could take pictures and the irony was that geologists said that when they're used to it they, that they put something next to a rock when they're taking a picture of it that they know the size of and to have a penny up there as well so that they can use it as a gauge of um, scale why they're up there uh, also on the curiosity rover you had um autographs from the uh, president at the time. So Obama's on there, the vice president, Joe Biden's on there. Uh, and there's also some NASA um, uh, representatives that are on there as well. Um, the bits in red there, they are microchips that have got 1.2 million signatures on them that were submitted by the public. Um, so they're uh, deep within the um, Curiosity rover there. And the wheels actually spell out the letters JPL in Morse code as it goes across the surface of Mars. So yes, another little thing that NASA have done there. So it's a really nice little trick that they do. Those, those hidden little things that you probably don't know about. Um, perseverance. So that's the first thing that we've landed uh, over a ton. So it's probably landed about this time last year now. So it's been on the surface for about 12 months. Um, it was the size of a small car, as I say, first thing they've landed that's over a ton. Um, and on the parachute, um, this guy here, is Ian Clark, spelt out in parachutes, in binary on the parachute, dare mighty things, as you can see around the outside there, which is the uh, the motto of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And they've even put the GPS coordinates of the uh, the headquarters in Pasadena on the parachute there. So yes, another nice little trick. And then the whole reason why this talk came about really, which was the Mars helicopter, uh, the Ingenuity, um, it's um, it was sort of, um, linked to or, or compared to the Wright Brothers launch, the first powered flight on another planet. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's got a little part of its canvas that was stowed away underneath there, as you can, underneath that little bit there, as you can see them putting it in. So yes, part of the canvas will be on Mars for the rest of time on the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, yes, so even missions to asteroids, we put these things on. So you've got Dawn, which was a mission that was launched back in 2007 that went to uh, Vesta and Ceres. Um, it carries a microchip that bears 360,000 names, which you can see is stored um, behind the main dish here. Um, and then there was a copy uh, that was made. That's um, It's only two centimetres in diameter, and it was put on display at the um, open house event back in 2007. Um, yeah, it's got 364,000 names on it. So that's phenomenal. So they do this quite a lot. 
so that people can get their names and you can even go online and um, have apply to have your name put on Mars on, on particular missions. More recently, launched back end of last year, the Lucy mission. Um, this is going to the um, Trojan asteroids that are in the Lagrange points three and four of Jupiter, trapped in its orbit there because of its immense gravity power, power, power source. Um, and it's going to be um, visiting L4, coming back, visiting L5, and it will be on a constant loop backwards and forwards in a stable orbit and we'll be doing that for many many hundreds of thousands of years uh, and it's got a plaque on it that's um, sayings from famous people and the idea is not for this to be an extraterrestrial message but for humans to retrieve it uh, later on in the future so you've got things like um, you can see you've got the Beatles on there uh, you've got a message from Albert Einstein you can see Martin Luther King on there and Carl Sagan and Brian May. So all of those have, um, are on this gold disc that's on Lucy. Um, coming nearer home now, so low Earth orbit, where we talk about the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. Um, so Amelia Hearhart, so her watch here has been to the International Space Station. So it was flown up there by um, uh, one of the uh, NASA astronauts on um, Soyuz TMA-19 in June 2010. Um, so yeah, and uh, the other part of Amelia Hearhart that's gone up is her scarf there. So astronaut Randy Bresnik took that up there uh, and he was the grandson of Amelia Hearhart's um, authorized photographer. And he took that up on there on STS-129 back in 2009. Um, space shuttle now so probably one of the not so famous parts unless you can remember it was when they did international toys in space now they've done this a few times the first time they did it back in uh, 1985 when they took 11 toys up and the idea was that um, they can show kids by using everyday objects how they react in space um, they did um, another one back in uh, 1993 where they took um, 29 up uh, and then they did another one in 1996 um, where they just took another 10 up um, and they'd done a resource guide on that one so that's one part of this so the children could understand how they all worked and then in 2002 they took them up to the International Space Station um, so yes this is those four missions that toys have gone into space it's just so that um, say children can understand um, how they work based on everyday objects and how they react in a micro environment. And then finally for me then, a couple of uh, PR stunts, um, uh, STS-120, it had the lightsaber that was used by, used by Mark Hamill in the 1983 film Return of the Jedi, uh, and it was to mark the 30th anniversary of the Star Wars franchise, so that was taken up there. Uh, and then Buzz Lightyear probably famously has spent longer in space than any other human being and he went up on STS-124 in 2008 as part of Disney's Year of a Million Dreams project again to promote um, uh, space to the younger generation. <laughs>